It's time for the only show that takes a look at the obstacles and opportunities open to small and mid-sized enterprises to manufacture here in America. It's time for Manufacturing Talk Radio with your host, Tim Grady. Hey, Tim. Well, hello. We'd like to welcome our listeners back to the show. Today we have a returning guest, Mr. Brad Holcomb, who is the chair of the Institute of Supply Management Manufacturing Business Survey Committee. Welcome back to the show, Brad. Tim, thanks for having me again. It's a pleasure. Well, we're very excited. And before we jump into the ISM report on business for November, which was released yesterday, I'd like to give our listeners a postscript from our last show. Our guests were Paul Gerbino. He is the publisher of Thomas Net News, and Beth Goodbaum. She is the editor of Thomas Net News Career Journal. Paul and Beth spoke about uh, the Thomas Net Industry Market Barometer Report that highlights very important issues and trends for the North American manufacturing sector. And more than 1,200 respondents of small to mid-sized businesses were part of that survey. And here are the takeaways from, from two weeks ago. These companies are really the hotbeds of technology and innovation. There are several hundred thousand unfilled jobs in the manufacturing sector today as we speak. More are coming as the baby boomers retire, but only 25% of the current manufacturing workforce are 18 to 34 year, year olds. And by 2025, it's expected to be 75%. So here's the challenge. Manufacturing right now, I guess, is not seen as cool, like the tech industries. Industry needs a brand makeover because manufacturing is where technology is applied. Give you an example. Just from yesterday, we saw Jeff Bezos of Amazon.com introducing drones to deliver packages. The design, parts fabrication, assembly, and testing of those drones happened in manufacturing. So if you're looking for a cool place to work and apply what you learned in school or college and develop tangible products for tomorrow, manufacturing a place is a place you should be looking. And now let's jump into the ISM report with Brad Holcomb. Brad, give us an overview of the report, and then we'll get into the details. How is manufacturing doing? Well, manufacturing is uh, is kind of on a roll um, this month. Uh, we were at 57.3 in terms of the PMI, which is the highest level of the year. And each month since uh, May has outdone uh, the previous month. So we're on a, a building process here, uh, reaching a new high for the year. In fact, it's the highest level since April of 2011. Uh, wow. All of the underlying metrics are, are solid, uh, pointing up and to the right, and we'll get into the details of all of that, but very pleased that we're continuing the momentum of the second half of this year. That's great, and, and one of the things I want to touch on as we get into the detail is uh, the ISM puts out on their website, www.ism.ws, a semi-annual forecast, and the last one was in April, and the one is coming up in December. But for this report, um, what are the industries that seem to be leading the charge, Brad? The industries that uh, are at the top of the list, and, and you referred them to the website. Uh, again, it's a little tricky, www.ism.ws or simply Google ISM report on business. And I would invite our listeners to uh, to put up the website now so that perhaps you can follow along in, in more detail. Uh, we're going to get into a fair amount of uh, detail in terms of uh, discussing the 18 different uh, manufacturing industries that we cover, that covers the gamut of U.S. manufacturing, in terms of their contribution to uh, manufacturing GDP. And um, uh, also uh, we'll talk about how those particular industries fared uh, this month uh, in, in a couple of different uh, categories. So, so to start that discussion, 
uh, we develop a PMI number for each of our industries. And that list is on the bottom of page one, if you will. Um, and we list our uh, industries in the order of most growth reported uh, to least growth reported. And then we also talk about uh, any industries that are declining uh, or are standing pat or in neutral relative to the previous month. So for the month of November, it, uh, on the top of the list is plastic and rubber products. Um, next is textile mills. Uh, third is furniture and related products. Uh, fourth is primary metals. Next is food, beverage, and tobacco products. Uh, paper products, printing and related activities. And I'll read the entire list and then come back and, and, uh, discuss. Uh, petroleum and coal products, miscellaneous manufacturing, electrical equipment, appliances and components transportation equipment, chemical products, computer and electronic products, non-metallic mineral products, and fabricated metal products. Those 15 industries of our 18, and clearly many of our largest industries, are reported growth uh, in the month of November. There are uh, three that are reporting some contraction uh, in November, and the list starts with, in this case, the most contraction reported apparel, leather, and allied products. Next is wood products, a little bit surprising there, uh, and then finally machinery. And none are reporting, um, you know, equal to, to last year. So we've got all 18 accounted for on this list, and and you get some sense of the order. I didn't realize that the order that you have them listed in is from, for instance, most growth to least growth of those who are experiencing growth. I know that uh, having prime, primary metals there uh, in, kind of in fourth place, if you will, would excite uh, Mr. Lou Weiss from All Metals and Forge Group, who is typically my co-host, but he's globetrotting today, so he's not with us. Um, why don't you uh, take our listeners through some of the details of, uh, of the reports and the industries. Uh, would you like to start with new orders, or would you like to start with an industry discussion, Brad? Well, let's start with uh, a, a broad table that we call manufacturing at a glance, and that's on, on page two, if you will, of our report. And it puts really everything in perspective. If you just had a few minutes, uh, I'd spend time on this particular table each month. Uh, it discusses, number one, uh, the PMI uh, at 57.3 and the fact that it's up 0.9 percentage points uh, from October. The next five metrics in the table, namely new orders, production, employment, supplier deliveries, and inventories, one, two, three, four, five. Those are the specific uh, sub-supporting indexes that feed into the PMI to create the PMI weighted equally. So those are all weighted at, at 20%. And as I, I made a comment earlier, everything is pointing up and to the right New orders at 63.6, up three percentage points from last month. To be above 60 is, is a really solid number. Production as well, up two percentage points to 62.8. Uh, another one that a lot of people are interested in is employment, up 3.3 percentage points to 56.5. That's the biggest number since, uh, I think, April of 2012 and it should bode well for employment numbers coming out later in the week. Uh, supplier deliveries uh, at 53.2 means uh, that supplier deliveries are slowing, and the interpretation of supplier deliveries slowing is that suppliers are having a hard time keeping up with the demand for manufacturing, and that's a good thing. 
So slowing supplier deliveries is a good thing, anything above 50. And then finally, inventories, uh, meaning raw materials inventories is at 50.5, you know, right at that dividing line between, uh, between growing and contracting inventories being well managed. So, you know, all of those metrics again are above 50. They feed into the PMI equally weighted, uh, to, uh, to achieve this 57.3. On the table as well, are one, two, three, four, five additional metrics that we that we look at and track and trend. Um, but we do that independently. That is, the PMI doesn't uh, doesn't revolve around these specifically. One is customer inventories. That's finished goods inventories, and at 45, it's too low, which is a good thing. Again. Because if customer inventories are too low, there would be a tendency to to restock and to refill those those shelves. Prices at uh, 52.5, down three percentage points. You know, broadly speaking, prices are well in control. Uh, no concerns about inflationary prices. Suppliers are comfortable with their pricing of raw materials. And uh, we won't see price increases until the early part of uh, next year, which is pretty typical. Uh, another interesting one, of course, they're all interesting, but backlog of orders at 54 up to and a half means that there's there's previous orders, more previous orders that they haven't gotten to yet. So that's a, a good thing as well above 50. The last two exports and imports, exports at 59.5, the highest we've seen in, in a couple of years, 12 months in a row of, uh, of growing exports. What, what that means to me and to our panel is that the non-domestic uh, world, if you will, the international community loves our products, loves U.S.-made products, the quality, certainly the pricing, the availability, the selection, and it, it shows up in our export numbers. Uh, finally on the list, imports, meaning imports uh, largely of raw materials and subassemblies at 55. That's a solid number. That's been growing for 10 consecutive months. So, again, all of these numbers are sort of up and to the right uh, in very good shape uh, as we uh, look at November and get close to the end of the year. Brad, in your experience, these very upward number trends, uh, is there a time in recent history where we've had this kind of strength in manufacturing? That, that, that's a great question. If I go back to 2011, uh, there was this kind of strength in the first four or five months of the year. And then the second half sort of petered out, if you will. Uh, this this feels a lot different. Of course, it's two and a half years removed from that. Uh, and, and let me also point out that I've alluded to the second half of 2013 being very solid. This The first half, in comparison, the average PMI in the first half of this year was 51.5, okay? You know, moving along, but nothing to write home about, if you will. Okay. The average for the second half uh, so far, July through November, is 56.2. That's a difference of 4.7 percentage points, a, a very meaningful difference, suggesting to me that we're in a different environment uh, in the second half, and, you know, that's a good thing. And I, I just don't see anything in terms of headwinds right now that would uh, that would change this uh, for the, you know, certainly the, the balance of the year, one month to go, and heading into next year. Okay, great. Now, uh, let's talk about, if you will, uh, if, I'm not, if I'm not jumping too far ahead, New orders that that one took a real right. jump this past month. Yeah, new orders uh, definitely, and and I, I think that uh, 
while all of these sub indexes are are all important, and as I said, the the five that feed into the PMI are equally weighted. Uh, new orders clearly drives this whole system. I mean, a continuation of new business uh, is what it's all about. And um, at 63.6, uh, that's a very solid number. I think it's been above 60 for, for four or five consecutive months um, and, uh, and, and, you know, and trending well. So that list, if we look on the bottom of page three, if you're looking on a paper copy, under new orders, we show that 12 of our 18 industries are reporting growth and in this order. And, you know, you're, gonna, you know, Lewis is going to love this one. Primary metals, top of the list. Uh, textile mills, next. Furniture and related products, third, plastic and rubber products, food, beverage, and tobacco products, transportation equipment, fabricated metal products, paper products, miscellaneous manufacturing, chemicals products, machinery, and finally, electrical equipment, appliances, and components. Only two industries report a decrease in new orders, and those were wood products and non-metallic mineral products. So 12 of of, of our industries, so it, it's pretty broad-based, and if you kind of do some groupings, if you will, there are a few industries related to the auto industry, and we know that's going well. I saw a headline today of, you know, the auto industry best month in, you know, X amount of time, you know, once again, um, industries related to, to housing, you know, whether it's, you know, furniture and related products, uh, or electrical equipment, you know, those relate to housing. And then we see, uh, food, beverage and, and tobacco, uh, people are, are, you know, enjoying their, their meals these days, uh, and uh, that's one of our largest industries. So uh, a, a broad grouping of products here that uh, that uh, speaks well for you know the the economy and certainly for manufacturing. That's terrific. We're going to take a quick commercial break here, and then we're going to come back and talk with Brad about production. The Institute for Supply Management, or ISM, as it's commonly known is a not-for-profit educational association that serves more than 40,000 supply management professionals with over 150 affiliates in more than 90 countries. ISM's mission is to enhance the value and performance of procurement and supply chain management practitioners and their organizations worldwide. They do this through education, research, standards of excellence, and, as we're hearing this morning, information dissemination including the renowned ISM Report on Business. For more information on any or all of this, simply visit their website at www.ism.ws. That's ism.ws. WS. When you use the Premier Rewards Gold Card from American Express, the rewards points can keep on multiplying. Buy three with triple points on airfare. Buy two with double points on gas and groceries. And a single point for pretty much every other dollar you spend on the card. Then, start choosing from over a million rewards to redeem all those points. Apply today and the annual fee for the first year is on us. Call 1-800-AXP-GOLD or visit axpgold.com. The annual fee for the card is $175. See terms, conditions, and restrictions at axpgold.com. And just a quick word about our sponsor today, All Metals and Forge Group and ISO 9001 and AS9100 registered company provides manufacturing and industrial companies with quick price and delivery quotes and clean quality forgings for their parts. From aircraft engines and landing gears to gear blanks and downhole shafts, hubs, subs, you name it, they can do it. To learn more, simply visit steelforge.com or send us your request for quote for any open die forgings or seamless rolled rings from 20 pounds to over 80,000 pounds. Find out more, simply visit steelforge.com. 
And now back to Tim and Brad and the new positive report. That's a that's a pleasant surprise here. Well, this is some terrific news, Brad. This is probably, I don't know if the mainstream media is touting this, but this is probably the best news we've heard uh, in some time. How is production doing? Well, production is doing great, and uh, the mainstream media is is really has really picked up on this as well. And uh, you know, I think that uh, it it always is is seen on our release date uh, yesterday in terms of uh, stock market activity. I think we 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 kind of helped to to keep this uh, this market in, in check uh, yesterday, uh, despite some. You know, not so positive news in, in other sectors. Okay. So it, it was, uh, again, very well received and it beat, uh, estimates, uh, that Wall Street had for, I think, 55 and, and change. So we always, we always like to come in and, and beat estimates. Uh, <laughs> right. let's talk about, yeah, yeah, let's talk about production next. Um, production is a, is a, Planned activity, uh, manufacturers, uh, as, as our listeners well know, try to maintain a, a steady uh, production load, if you will, relative to their capacity, relative to their employment. And uh, to, to do that, they utilize the combination of new orders and the backlog of orders, which, uh, which we've discussed, uh, and those are at uh, both strong levels. Uh, production was uh, at uh, 62.8. It's been above uh, 60. I've got in front of me the last four months, uh, perhaps a little bit longer. And we've got 13 industries uh, reporting growth in production. And I'll give that list in, in just a second. But I thought I'd take a, a little bit of a side trip here to, to zero in on the 18 industries that we do cover and try to give our listening audience some perspective on which ones are, are the largest and then go on down down the list, if you will. And I appreciate that I'll be, you know, talking about, you know, a lot of detail here, um, but hopefully uh, our listeners can get a sense of, um, of things in perspective. And, and our, uh, our whole set of metrics, is gauged to, in our panel of 350 people that report data from their factories are positioned relative to the size of this particular, of their particular industry as it relates to all of manufacturing. So the number one industry that we have at uh, nearly 16% of manufacturing GDP is computer and electronic products. And as I think about that, it certainly continues to make sense as we are a very technological society, a lot of computers, electronic products, you know, everywhere. Uh, and so no, no surprise there. So that's our largest industry. Uh, second is chemical products at uh, 13 uh, plus percent. Number three is food, beverage, and tobacco products at just over 12% of manufacturing GDP. Okay, fourth on the list is petroleum and uh, coal products. And then rounding out the top five is machinery, which uh, in our case has a lot to do with uh, capital expenditures uh, improving our plants, which happens, you know, on a, on a regular basis. And so those are the top five. And, uh, number six is transportation equipment manufacturing at, uh, seven and a half percent. That includes, you know, cars, trucks, uh, airplanes, uh, and such. Seven is fabricated metal products which feeds into the uh, auto industry and, and others as well. Uh, number eight on the list, miscellaneous manufacturing at uh, five and a quarter percent of manufacturing GDP. 
Number nine is plastic and rubber products at uh, just about 4%. Paper products is uh, 10th on the list at 3 and a third percent. Uh, 11th on the list is electrical equipment, appliances, and components at uh, two and a half or so percent. 12 is primary metals at two and a half percent. Uh, getting close to the end here, 13 is non-metallic mineral products at 2%. Uh, 14, printing and related support activities, uh, almost 2%. Uh, 15 is furniture and related products at uh, one and three quarters percent. 16 is wood products at one and a third percent. And then the last two, 17 textile mills and textile products at about one percent. And then finally, apparel and leather and allied products at uh, about 0.7 percent. So if you're listening, hopefully you caught your particular industry and how it uh, relates to this list of, of 18. And again, we position our panel according to the contribution of their particular industry in the grand scheme of things relative to manufacturing. That's how we get a very balanced uh, report, unlike uh, any other report out there that certainly we're aware of. Brad, I think that is really Grand information. I, I think it's important that, as we have been discussing uh, the last two shows with you, that the listening audience and the people who read this report understand the data behind that that monthly number. There's so much here that this is really helpful. Thank you for providing that breakdown of the yeah. 18 industry. Yeah. Well, you're absolutely right, and, and that can't be... Um you know, overemphasized. Uh, there is a tremendous amount of information here useful to all levels of, uh, of folks in manufacturing, you know, from, from, you know, presidents and general managers, uh, you know, through the, through the ranks to, you know, buyers and planners, uh, lots of, of, of solid information to provide you know, perspective on, on your company and how it's faring in your industry uh, and in, uh, you know, the broader context of manufacturing. So in, in production, let's go to that then. Uh, as I said, production is a um, almost a, a consequence of new orders and a backlog of orders. We have 13 industries reporting growth in production during November. Uh, in the following order. Primary metals, textile mills, furniture and related products, food, beverage, and tobacco products, paper products, plastic and rubber products, electrical equipment, appliances, and components, fabricated metal products, miscellaneous manufacturing, transportation equipment, computer and electronic products, chemical products, and finally machinery. Then there are three industries reporting a decrease in the order of most decrease reported is apparel, leather, and allied products. Next is wood products, and then non-metallic mineral products. Now, Brad, so, so you mentioned produ wood products list. before and that it was kind of a surprise. What what about that decrease that you're seeing in wood products is, is a surprise? We see, uh, I think, Home Starts Up and I think Home Depot right. and Lowe's are reporting uh, uh, higher numbers for lumber sales. Yeah. What's the surprise? The, the surprise is that, you know, it's on the, the declining list in, in a couple of different areas when all, all of what you said is true. Housing, which is what this largely relates to, is, is up. I think this is likely to be seen as, as momentary and an inventory adjustment. We heard from time to time that, uh, you know, home builders uh, are, are having a hard time keeping up with demand due to, you know, the amount of uh, skilled labor that's available. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and related. So 
they're they're backing off of uh, buying more inventory at the moment because of you know those situations would be my my guess. Uh, wood products as well as furniture and related products has been on the the, the top end of the, these lists throughout the year, which is why I say it was a surprise to me. But then, um, uh, as I mentioned, uh, I, I think it certainly could be momentary due to uh, an over uh, shooting of inventory. Now, I'm really excited about the next topic because we're coming out of the Great Recession where employment was, uh, unemployment was the highest it's been probably since 19, the 1930s. Uh, right. Give us a, a, your read on the employment numbers that you've got here, Brad. Yeah. You know, every, everyone, uh, you know, really looks at this uh, since, you know, over the past few years since we're starting to climb out of the recession. It's, uh, you know, it's a very difficult subject for, for a lot of folks. Um, and I think we've all had friends that uh, have been out of a job and, and we, we help them seek new jobs and, and so on. So a lot of people obviously focus uh, uh, on employment. And and for us to see now a 56.5 up 3.3 percentage points um, in November uh, is, is a very good month. I think that's the highest uh, number in, in a couple of years. And it should bode well for the government numbers that come out towards the end of the week. And and by the way, this is one of the areas why, you know, the Fed and the White House really, you know, and other economists really love this report because it's a leading indicator to, to many, many other indexes and, and data that come out, uh, you know, subsequently, either a few days or a few weeks. And it gives them an early indication of, of things. So, generally speaking, um, you know, a good number in uh, in our employment number leads to a, a a good number in the Bureau of Labor Statistics uh, that will come shortly. Mm, okay. What 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 this means is that um, if you, if you put this all in perspective and you know follow this month after month, you get a feel for you know, what these things mean beyond the numbers, if you will. And what this means to me is that manufacturing now realizes that it's had several months of, of strength and it's been building moment, momentum since uh, the beginning of the second half, month over month, increasing PMI. So they're much more comfortable uh, and proactive about more hiring because they see and feel more of the same coming down the pike, if you will. So uh, they're not necessarily being aggressive here, but they're certainly being proactive to make sure they have enough people on board to, to meet the demands that they see now and that they see coming up in the near future. And so they're definitely hiring, filling open positions, and making sure that they've got enough uh, you know, employees, uh, whether it's labor or others on board to meet demands. I see that textile mills leads the charge in employment. That's interesting. Well, it is. I've, I've been reading headlines about textile mills in the past uh, few months, and there seems to be a resurgence of, of interest in in for example, apparel made in America. Um, I just bought a pair of jeans that were made in America, and um, they're pretty darn good quality. And they got a little flag on the pocket, made in America. Uh, <laughs> so I think this is one of the areas that you know people are thinking about when they talk about you know reshoring and bringing manufacturing back to the U.S., which is a whole other discussion. Uh, but I certainly see that uh, being discussed uh, broad and deep, and textile mill seems to be sort of leading leading the list of, of things that are really happening. I've also uh, specifically heard with respect to textile mills that they've been having difficulty finding, you know, the type of skills that are required 
that used to be plentiful, I'm sure, uh, in the U.S., but we have to rebuild that labor base and, um, and, you know, there might be some retraining and, and, and reschooling involved. And I'm, I'm just really personally interested in, uh, in the fact that textile mills is, is leading that particular list. Yeah, that's uh, that, uh, uh, fascinating to uh, watch that happen. You know, and, and again, if that's a particular story that comes to mind when I look at this report and I, you know, I've been uh, immersed in the report, but there are many, many other stories and stories for our listeners in their particular industry. You can grab your industry from any and all of these lists month over month, track and trend your your particular industry and uh, find, uh, you know, some areas of, of uh, interest, some areas to take advantage of. Uh, and, and so I certainly uh, encourage everyone to do that. And before we get into supplier deliveries, we're a, a little going to be a little ahead of ourselves here, but I think I'd like to uh, take a commercial break here so that we can uh, not interrupt our discussion on supplier delivery. So why don't we uh, break real quick for a commercial and then we'll come back. It takes 12 years to create a graduate. It takes about the same time to create a dropout. And at the end of the day, the difference between a child becoming one or the other could be you. So United Way is asking you to make a pledge. Tutor a child who needs help. Mentor a kid who needs someone on their side. Volunteer to read to children. Because when a child advances, we all advance. Be a reader. Tutor or mentor. Give. Advocate. Volunteer. Live United. Take the pledge now at liveunited.org. Brought to you by United Way and the Ad Council. And once again, we want to remind you that the Institute for Supply Management, or ISM as it's commonly known here in the industry, is a not-for-profit educational association that serves more than 40,000 supply management professionals with more than 150 affiliates around the world in more than 90 countries. ISM's mission is to enhance the value and performance of procurement and supply chain management practitioners and their organizations worldwide. They do this through education, standards of excellence, research, and, as we're discussing today, information, gathering, and dissemination. All of this is easily available and searchable. Hopefully you're following along today with us, in fact, as we're going through the uh, monthly report that just came out yesterday. But all of this is searchable, findable, and digestible if you visit their website at ism.ws. That's the Institute for Supply Management at ISMWS. Go there and find out more what's happening in this industry. When you use the Premier Rewards Gold Card from American Express, the rewards points can keep on multiplying. Buy three with triple points on airfare. Buy two with double points on gas and groceries. And a single point for pretty much every other dollar you spend on the card. Then, start choosing from over a million rewards to redeem all those points. Apply today and the annual fee for the first year is on us. Call 1-800-AXP-GOLD or visit axpgold.com. The annual fee for the card is $175. See terms, conditions, and restrictions at axpgold.com. And, of course, a final shout-out to uh, the All Metals and Forge Group, our sponsor for Manufacturing Talk Radio each and every episode. All Metals and Forge Group is your best source for open-die forgings and seamless rolled rings in alloy, carbon, stainless steel, and tool steels. Nickel, aluminum, titanium, copper, you name it, they can handle it. Just go to steelforge.com or send us your RFP request for quote. That's steelforge.com. And now back to uh, a final wrap-up, a final look at uh, the positive, impressive uh, manufacturing port that uh, we're discussing this morning. Now, you guys have come up with lots of interesting stuff here. I'm, I'm surprised this isn't uh, front-page news on the Wall Street Journal here today. Here, I'm, I'm glad that uh, we're uh, covering it in such detail, but I'm surprised others aren't. Yeah, I'd love to see it. And and Brad, you made a very interesting comment about supplier deliveries, that slower supplier deliveries is a good thing. Can you go into that a bit? Yes. Um, but before I do that, uh, speaking of commercial plugs, I want to plug our December 10th coming up semi-annual report. We do that each December, and then we do a, a tune-up in April-May time frame 
that's loaded with sort of wrapping up the current year, but also it's a first forecast for 2014 for the year ahead. And I'll invite our listeners to, to tune in, look at the website on December 10th. Last December, our panel, the same panel, predicted that the second half of this year would be substantially better than the first half, and we see that, uh, you know, coming into fruition uh, big time. So our reports and our forecasts are pretty good. The next one is coming up on December 10th. Uh, in terms of supplier deliveries, when the number is above 50, and it's at 53.2, it means supplier deliveries are slowing. And they're slowing in terms of raw materials to the manufacturing plants because of the activity, right? There's, there's so much activity within manufacturing in terms of new orders, in terms of high levels of production, et cetera, that uh, suppliers are having a harder time keeping up. So their deliveries are slowing, and we feel that that's a good thing within bounds. Uh, it just simply says that, you know, the the whole supply chain is, is tight and, and it's kind of wound up because there's so much activity. Well, that's great. That's and, great to know. It's something that I didn't uh, understand about supplier deliveries. And a matter of fact, a lot of what's coming out in the discussion today, I think, is incredibly helpful to our listeners. Yeah. Uh, so, so that's the fourth. Uh, metric that feeds directly into the PMI. The, the fifth one is inventories, meaning inventories of raw materials, which is also one that it, it takes a little bit of, of thinking and context and perspective from month to month and sort of, you know, period to period. Generally speaking, you know, 50 means that inventories are just right. Below 50 means they're lean. Above 50 means that they're, you know, the opposite of lean. But in, in this particular environment of growth and continuing growth and a trend in that direction, uh, a number above 50 is definitely, you know, desirable and good news because our, our factories will plan it that way. They'll plan to have plenty of inventory on hand uh, to meet demand. Sometimes in another context, in a recessionary environment, a number above 50 will represent unwanted inventory, and that's not a good thing. So you have to really understand the, the, the context of, of the number. But in today's environment, a number above 50 is definitely good news and feeds uh, in a positive fashion into the PMI. Uh, inventories, uh, for me, have been well-managed and well-controlled uh, this year, uh, and we know that in our semi-annual reports, there'll be discussion about the importance of inventory control uh, from our manufacturers, and, and certainly it's an area where you can... Uh, have an opportunity to control costs, to contain costs, but also to uh, to feed production, obviously. No, I'm looking uh, at ten your, of a, go, go ahead. I, I'm sorry, Brad. I'm looking at your uh, April manufacturing sector summary, um, in, in which the operating rate was currently then at 80.2 percent of normal capacity. Uh, when right. do they start hitting the capacity wall? Yeah. About 85% in, in my experience and in, in talking with others from, from my manufacturing background, 85% is, is generally been considered, you know, pretty tight and at the point where the CFOs need to start opening up the purse strings to, you know, to add facilities, uh, capital and, uh, and perhaps more employment as well. Okay. Now we've just got a couple of minutes left here. Is there anything you'd like to wrap up for our listeners, Brad? We've, we've covered the, the first five uh, metrics uh, that feed directly into the PMI. Again, there are other metrics here that are very interesting. Prices, I think, are particularly um, important to understand. And when it comes to pricing and things in that general area, 
I think we mentioned last time, we, we have a list of commodities each month that are up in price, as reported by the panel, and down in price, and also in short supply. And that's really good to, to focus on. Uh, this time we see, you know, steel and steel products uh, up, in, up in price. Um, and, 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 and so if, if you're buying steel, you know, you want to track that uh, just as an example uh, to, to gauge when to buy and when not to buy. So, again, we're, we're, we're covering more information here. Uh, there's more information yet to be discussed and to be uh, really appreciated on a month-to-month basis. Well, certainly we would like to uh, entertain having you back on the show. Um, I, we're, we're all looking forward to the December 10th uh, report that's coming out. I didn't realize that that was the forecast and the April was the tune-up. That's terrific information. Uh, do you see... Uh, if you take a look at that December forecast, and I don't want to steal any of your thunder, uh, do we seem to be continuing to look strong going into 2014? Can't really comment on that. Uh, you know, these things are, are highly controlled on a month-to-month basis as well as the semi-annual, so you'll just have to tune in. But it, it will be a very interesting wrap-up of 2013 as well as a, as a detailed look ahead to uh, 2014, our forecasts, uh, we, we compare how well we're doing in our forecasts uh, from year to year and semi-annual to semi-annual, so you can get a feel for whether, you know, this is good information or, or not. I suggest that it's excellent information, and I often tell people that the semi-annual reports have even more value in our month-to-month reports in many respects. So with that teaser, uh, please uh, please look at that on December 10th and uh, enjoy the reading. Well, we certainly will. That uh, I'm looking at the April report. Uh, that just terrific information. Is any of that information, uh, Brad, given, um, I see it's in a PowerPoint presentation, it's in a written form, is any of it in an audio form? Uh, don't believe it's in an audio form. Uh, we, we do have the PowerPoints. Uh, we, we do have the reports themselves all on the same website. Uh, you can find them easily in the same publication section. So you can go back and, 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 and take a look and, and look forward to seeing them posted, uh, you know, in a timely fashion when we, when we report, for example, on December 10th. Now, you, you've referred to the April, which is a tune-up. The December one is two to three times the size of the April report and has a, a ton of uh, perspective uh, on the current year and a ton of interesting uh, predictions for next year. Uh, in some cases, it's uh, first half versus second half, as I mentioned uh, one time before on this call. Okay. Well, gosh, Brad, thank you so much for coming back on our show, uh, for going into this report in, in such detail. Uh, it's, I think it's been invaluable for our listeners to get a, a deeper and greater understanding of what you've presented here today. We certainly look forward to having you on again in the future. Uh, we just want to thank you for being our guest again today. Well, it's my pleasure, and I'd like to wish everyone uh, a happy holiday season. Thanks, Brad, and to all our listeners, uh, happy holidays, and we'll see you or speak with you again on Manufacturing Talk Radio in about two weeks. You've been listening to the only show that takes a look at the obstacles and opportunities open to small and mid-sized enterprises to manufacture here in America with your host, Tim Grady and Lou Rice. Sponsored by All Forge Metal Group.